start off with just a little bit of uh, useless trivia from yesteryear. I'll be talking about that. I'll be talking a little bit about some, how some things were discovered, the techniques I used to discover things, and then I'll probably going to be playing about maybe five or six minutes, even longer, of an actual blue box in use recorded back in 1975. The audio tape is called Classic Tandem Stacking, and it's from wideweb.com slash phone trips. Lots of luck in finding it. It's pretty hard to find. The website isn't that easy to get around, but uh, it's called Classic Tandem Stacking. I'll be using excerpts from that audio file that was recorded by Doorbell in 1975. Doorbell was one of the original phone freaks that uh, used to frequent the 2111 conference from 604 2111. So without further ado, let's go into what I want to talk about here. I want to talk a little bit about the Apple stories, uh, starting off with uh, when the Apple first came out, the only way you can connect your Apple II to a video display is through a video input connector to a TV set. Not all TV sets had video input connectors. The only other way to do this was with a modulator, which was a small device which you had to purchase separate from Apple that would allow you to be able to transmit your Apple screen to a regular TV set and turn it to channel 3 or channel 4, depending on where you're physically located at. This modulator was uh, an additional, uh, additional device you had to buy separate from Apple. Many people have often wondered why you couldn't connect that modulator up and why they didn't design that modulator into the actual Apple II. Three words, FCC. It is illegal to uh, connect anything under Part 15 of the FCC rules and regulations without having a lot of red tape. And so that was sort of why that happened. Steve Jobs and the Waz Blue Boxes. Let's talk about those blue boxes. Steve's blue box had one major flaw. First of all, its frequencies were, in, were so accurate that you never had to tune it. The problem is the waveform output was a square wave. And when you send a square wave into an analog phone system, things don't tend to work right. You've got to fiddle with that little acoustical coupler on your, on your mouthpiece, get it just exactly the right distance apart, and maybe after seven or eight tries, your call will probably go through. But those seven, those seven tries you make that are unsuccessful, those drop a trouble card at the 4A switching toll tandem. And that attracts attention. And that's exactly how I got busted. I got busted because a friend of mine who wanted me to build him a blue box, I says, no way. He also knew Waz, went to Waz, bought his blue box for 150 bucks. And I told Richard, I said, Richard, you don't want to use this thing. You're going to get into trouble. He didn't listen to me. Another thing that he did, which I really, really didn't like, and he really abused my trust, was he took my phone number. He was the only person I ever gave out my phone number to, and uh, he wrote it down. Bad news. He used the blue box too many times from home. They detected it, and they busted him. And of course, when he got busted, my phone book or my address was in his phone book. And so that was how I got busted. So let's talk a little bit now about uh, the role that Call Computer had with Apple. First of all, let me tell you what Call Computer is. Call Computer was one of the very first timeshare systems where you can walk into a storefront and get an account on Call Computer and use their terminals for 99 cents an hour. And that was, that was timeshare for the rest of us. It's a BTI 2000 computer, basic only, but you can type your program in a punched paper tape, or you could store it in your own account, and you could run it. And I, I just completely fell in love with computers that I could actually interface with a computer. I took programming on an IBM 360 Fortran batch processing system. And let me tell you, programming under that environment totally sucked. Let's talk about some of the contributions to the home computer revolution. I, I was there. I, I witnessed everything. I witnessed Waz getting together with Jobs. I witnessed Waz and Jobs talking in his garage about building a computer. I saw Steve Jobs' computer. It was a six-bit computer. And I said, that thing is useless. It only counts up to 64. What good is that? 
And so, but the fact that he built it out of discrete components was really amazing. So what I did, as soon as the 8080 came out, this was about mid-1975, cross-assemblers for the rest of us. I used call computer, and I wrote a cross-assembler for call computer. From that, you could just type in your assembly language code in ASCII text, and it would assemble it and turn that ASCII text into machine code, and then it would then use to punch a paper tape, and then that paper tape could then be used to load it, load it into your Altair 880 computer. And a lot, of, a lot of sophisticated operating systems started out that way. And before the Apple, there was a TV terminal. The TV terminal was nothing more than a device with a RS-232 connector on it and an output modulator that go to a TV set. So turn your TV set into a terminal. Before the Homebrew Computer Club, there was the PCC, People's Computer Club. This was a small little strip mall in Menlo Park. And uh, there's a small little organization called the People's Computer Company. They had a PDP-8 there, and they were using EduBasic running on this PDP-8 giving children the first time an opportunity to sit at a computer terminal and play games, write programs, hunt the wumpus, or do what you normally do back in that day. I, I put a lot of prominent people together. I mean, Waz and Jobs, I met them. They were already together by the time I met them. But I mean, there were so many people that I ran across, and I just witnessed all of this very amazing things. That URL up on the screen, if you would mind, copy that down. That is uh, written by Bob Lash, one of the original founding fathers of the Homebrew Computer Club. And uh, give you a chance to copy that, because uh, that is a very interesting perspective and historical perspective of a day in the life of the com Homebrew Computer Club in Silicon Valley. I also wrote a lot of engineering programs on call computer. I was an electrical engineer by trade. Uh, I went to college to get my EE degree. And I designed and developed a lot of programs using analog, uh, analog uh, circuits to design uh, complicated Chevy Chef and Butter Butterworth filter circuit designs for a voice scrambler I was using. There was no way I could do that on a calculator. OK, I hope you guys got that URL copied down. Don't worry, you can probably get these slides later. Another thing that Call Computer did, they, they recruited local high school students to go in and write programs and Help the, help the facility uh, get together with uh, writing a lot of programs. And uh, then they put the programs up in the public library. So usually when you want a program, you'd have to write it yourself. You couldn't exactly go to a computer store back then and, write, and actually buy a program. One of the programs I wrote was called Indicta. Uh, this is a program that I'm using for dictation to write my book right now. And it's really useful. And maybe when I'm done with it, I can figure out how to market it. But right now, it works on a Macintosh. And uh, it's, it's really cool. I'm not here to show that program off or anything, but I've been using it quite extensively in writing my book. The Homebrew Computer Club, lots of startups were hatched from the club. There were no corporate secrets. The Computer Club was such an open exchange, it was just mind boggling. At the very beginning of the club, they had a, uh, they had a, uh, uh, what do you call a, uh, a random access period and a, and a mapping period. The mapping period started off with, if there was something you wanted to know about computers, you'd raise your hand, address the whole group, and you'd address the group, and then one or two persons in that group would raise their hand and say, yeah, I can help you. And then after, during the random access period, you could then meet and interface with that person to have him help you with some of your problems you have when you're building your first computer. It was one of the most amazing free exchanges anywhere. It wasn't until after somebody got a hold of a, a, hold of a paper tape from uh, Microsoft's BASIC. And uh, Bill, uh, Bill Gates wrote a scathing open letter to the Homebrew Computer Club touting and, you know, and so ticked off that they were making copies of this BASIC program and sharing it. Bill Gates didn't want to have anything to do with that. But it got out. And that's what got Bill Gates and, and Microsoft started. And Bill Gates actually was the first person ever to consider that programming was closed. Bad idea. As, as work went on, this was about 1976, Steve Wozniak approached me one day and said, 
how would you like to build a telephone interface board for the Apple II? And I says, hmm, uh, will I get paid while I'm developing it? He says, sure, you can work in my office here in Cupertino. And there was this little strip mall in Cupertino where Apple Computer had just one big room. And then off to the side was a very small little annex to Apple Computer where all of the really cool stuff was done. And I was in that room there with Steve Wozniak, uh, Randy Wigginton was one of the first high school kids, and actually Randy was one of the persons who, who I actually mentored at Call Computer. And Randy now is still working at Apple right now. He's a chief, he's a big executive making tons and tons of money, and he's in charge of a lot of cool things at Apple. So what did this phone port do? It could just about do anything. It could send and receive any tones. You can map the two tones together. You can create any frequencies you want and match the two tones to make any digits you want. It could do just about anything. It could detect the difference between a busy signal and a ring. It could even recognize certain voice commands if you knew how to do it right. The biggest problem was it was illegal to connect it to the phone line. You had to buy a $30 a month device from Ma Bell to connect anything to the phone company. And it had all kinds of filters in it, and you couldn't do a lot with it. You couldn't control the hook switch. You couldn't control a lot of stuff in the phone. So it just made it impossible to use, which was one of the reasons why the phone board never saw the light of day. And I just recently talked to Steve Wozniak about three weeks ago and asked him, really, was that what happened? And Steve said, it, just was, it was just a market decision that Steve Jobs made back in the day. But word has it that not only was Steve Jobs contacted by the, uh, by the AT&T and put a lot of pressure and legal pressure on not making that phone board see the light of day, uh, but that's also the basic three reasons. Number one, it wasn't really a viable product, which I disagree. Number two, it was you had to connect it directly to the phone line in order to get it to work and do stuff you wanted to do. And of course, number three, it could be used for illegal purposes, or in other words, it could have illegal thoughts. So my attorney said during one of my trials for using it. It can uh, also uh, detect and send blue box tones, limited speech recognitions. It can war dial and dial with over 30 different responses. It can detect another extension phone and, of course, evil thoughts. And these are the reasons why Steve Jobs didn't actually want to market it. However, I've got good news. I still have the phone board. It still exists with my friend in Sacramento, and it's the original board. It's my design, not the design that Steve Wozniak helped me with. So it, uh, it had more chips, but it also had better quality tones and better sensitivity because I had to make a lot of compromises to get rid of those four chips that Steve Wozniak didn't think I needed. I have it, and I'm going to release the schematic diagram of the board. I don't know when. Don't bug me about it, but it's going to come out eventually, and of course the actual board itself will probably wind up in some museum somewhere. We're negotiating that right now. Let's talk a little bit about finding secret numbers. It is possible that I could go into any country. I'll give Russia as, as an example. In 1988, I went to the Soviet Union on, on kind of like a, a citizens exchange program. This was, of course, during the communist days when it was called the USSR, very strict very dreary, very drab, and uh, I just said to myself, what can I do here in the phone system without actually winding up in jail doing anything? First thing I did was I went to the phone book. The phone book is your best friend. First thing I did in the phone book is I looked for all the emergency services numbers, things like police, fire. Usually those numbers will have a lot less digits to dial, mostly three, like in the USA, 911, emergency, or in other countries, 101, for instance, or 102, or whatever they are. Those three-digit service numbers also can go to very interesting places if you know how to scan. And I found a lot of really cool numbers that way. It wasn't long before I found the, uh, the number that went into the KGB network. And uh, so with that, also because the phone system was all mechanical, I was able to flash the hook switch. So you dial zero on, a, on an old step exchange, your rotary dial goes and sends 10 pulses. What would happen if you sent 12 pulses or 11 pulses? What can you get doing that? Well, you can get some very interesting things. Computer access numbers, of course, are very important to get. 
and you can find those pretty easily just by scanning. Companies will rarely hide their computer access numbers in their PBXs. So if you go to a company and see if they have a PBX, you could scan that PBX and probably within about maybe three or four hours, you'll have all of their computer access numbers. You look for the unusual, and the phone book is again your very best friend. OCC codes. OCC stands for Other Common Carrier. In 1979, 1980, AT&T broke up into smaller phone companies. U.S. Sprint started offering long-distance service. Sprint originally started from actually the railroad system. The railroad system in the United States has got uh, their entire phone directory or their entire phone network set up so they can make calls from one, radio, one uh, railroad station to another. They built this amazing infrastructure, which eventually turned out to be Sprint of all things. But here's what you can do. Let's say you have a credit card code. OK, the hippies, used, what they used to do is they used to do actually uh, take uh, and give every year, the phone company would have a credit card code. The credit card code would usually be mapped to your, your phone number. Like if my phone number was 408-266-6666, then my credit card number would be 408-666-6666, and then there'd be a a four-digit number after that, and then followed with uh, a letter. Well, it didn't take the hippies long to find the, what those credit card codes were, and every time that credit card code every year comes out, I'd say within two or three months, you have the code. But then, you, then they started issuing uh, credit card numbers that are not tied to your phone number. Well, how can you tell and verify that this credit card is good? With a blue box, you can very easily do key pulse, 213-000, start, and go clunk, plop, you're connected into a trunk, and then you key pulse your, your credit card number, and it'll come back and it'll say, negative, negative, or it'll say, OK, OK. And that's what the operator can use to verify that that credit card number is good. <clears throat> Another thing that you could do, back, at, back just about the time you could direct dial credit card calls. This happened around 1980 to 1981. You could dial 0 plus the number. Normally, an operator would come on and ask you how you'd like to make the call. You can make it collect, you can bill it to a credit card number, and it's all manually done by the operator. Now, then, in 1981, they, they deployed a number called zero plus a number. They follow that with your credit card number, and then the call would go through. And it would come back and say, phong, after you dial the zero plus number, say phong, and it'll say ATT, and then you just enter in your ATT calling card, and it'll put, and it'll put the call through. But here's the really interesting thing. When you put credit card number is your is your 10-digit number plus a four-digit code after that. But instead of using a four-digit code, you use the ABCD trick. What that is is you have 1633 row, which is normally not on a touchtone phone. These are the special priority that the military uses. Well, if you use ABCD instead of that four-digit code, any number works for your credit card number, and you can make calls anywhere for free. These so-called transitions as ATT started breaking up, they started deploying something like these other common carrier codes. Now to make a call, you can choose which long distance carrier you want to use to make your call. You could dial 10288, follow that with the area code and number, and your call would go through with AT&T. If you dial 10222, follow that with the area code and number, the call would be handled by Sprint. You go up to a Berkeley payphone, 257. And you dial 10222, follow that with area code and number, and the call would go through. Berkeley, being a college town, shame on the phone company for allowing that exploit to happen. It really worked, and it worked for almost eight months before they finally shut it down. Then there was 950 numbers. 950 numbers were uh, numbers with ring combination 08, RC08. What a ring combination 08 means, you can call numbers from pay phones, and a pay phone is just a like home phone. You, it's free. You dial 950-1088. You get a phone, you dial your number, and your call goes through. There's no, you don't even have to put a dime in a payphone. It just goes through and works beautifully. So these are some of the, some of the numbers that you can do. Kind of in review are, you got, you got numbers like the police, your fire, phone repair. You've got mechanical switches. You can flash the hook switch. That doesn't really work anymore in today's, in today's phone system because they're all electronic now. They're all digital. And so you can pretty much not really 
depend on mechanical switches unless you happen to be in such a backward country that they're still using it. Recognition of what, you, what kind of error code you get when you make a call is also important. You make, a, you make a call and it'll come back and it'll give you like a busy signal or it'll come back and it'll say uh, something like, we're call, we're sorry, your call did not go through, uh, this is a recording, and then there's a four digit number after that, like 2132. The 213 says that the 213 exchange area code ex trunk handled that call. The 2 is a, is a number 14A that took that call. And then, of course, the 1633 information trick. You could be an information operator by just simply going, uh, calling your information, and then you put in the 1633 tone, and then you could intercept information calls by doing that. It's great for finding 800 numbers. Let's talk a little bit now about how blue boxes work and why they became such a problem with the phone company. Shame on the phone company for allowing in-band signaling to work. That was one of the most stupid, asinine things anybody could ever do. And to think that Ma Bell, AT&T, the big monopoly, could actually be so cheap as to use the same channel for both your speech and signaling, it was amazing that that would actually happen. So these tones are six tones and they're grouped into a binary arrangement. The tones are 700 hertz, 900 hertz, 1100, 1500, and 1700 hertz. These tones are odd because, they're, because when you combine them together, they don't intermodulate together. And that's one of the reasons why they are that, they are that way. So to make a number five would mean you would have the tone for four, which would be 1500 and the tone for one, which would be 700. So 1,500 plus 700 would be the digit five. Three would be uh, 700 plus 900. Or 700 actually would be the, uh, would equal to that, equal the value of zero. 900 would be the value of one. Uh, 1,100 would be two. 1,500 would be four. And 1700 is a special tone used for opening and closing your call. You start off with a key pulse, follow that with a phone number, and then you go to start, and then the call would go through. So now I'm going to give you a little demonstration of what this would sound like when you're actually done. Do we have audio ready? <laughs> Dialing a number. Step in numbers, old dial phone, you know. This is narrated by doorbell, by the way. The number that's ringing at this point doesn't matter. What's important is that this call has gone over a trunk from New York to a distant 4A, which can be reset by 2600. That's the supervision handshake, off hook, on hook. And now it's waiting for new digits, which Ben will supply. Those are not touchstones. What he dialed was 216-054-064. These are old routing codes. The network of the 1970s had routing codes for tandems in all major cities. The first code, 216-054, is the routing code for Youngstown, Ohio. The 064 in the area code of 216 is the routing code for Canton, Ohio. Both of these are crossbar tandems. When Ben keys in this sequence, the 4A into which he is keying picks up a trunk to Youngstown, Ohio, and sends 064. That tick is the 4A cutting through to Youngstown, Ohio after having sent 064. Now what does Youngstown do with the 064? Well, it picks up a trunk to Canton, that's the code for Canton, but having been sent only the routing code and no digits to follow it, it simply dumps us into the Canton trunk without sending anything. In other words, it stacks. That's the sound of Youngstown, Ohio dumping us into a trunk to Canton. And that's the handshake from Canton. Canton, Ohio is now ready to receive digits. Okay, now you notice there that the first time you heard, heard a handshake, there was just a very 
short little chirp. That chirp was 2600 hertz tone. The second time, it routed to the stack there. If you notice, there was two chirps, very close together and almost hard to detect. I just wanted to point that out because this is, some, this is basically the whole concept of how you could stack tandems. Stacking tandem is something that really caused the phone company major headaches. That's 054064. This causes Canton to pick up a trunk to Youngstown and send 064. Now we're in Youngstown again, which stacks into Canton, and then Canton gives us the handshake. Three this and time. And we'll do another 054064. Now we're in Youngstown again. Youngstown stacks to Canton. That's the handshake. And here we go again. Same digits. Youngstown. Canton. Handshake. Now the connection has gotten so long that the handshake is all you can hear. Now on that supervision flash, you could really hear multiple links, both on the off hook and the on hook. He's going around again. That was such a short flash that you didn't get to hear all the on-hooks. So there you have what it would sound like when you're actually stacking tandems, which is kind of cool, actually. This is a little bit of a procedure of how you actually do this, placing a call. Normally what, uh, what Doorbell did, he was just dialing a normal seven-digit number. He paid for that call. He didn't really defraud the phone company when he did that. He was just basically demonstrating what you can do and how you can actually take two number one crossbar switches and, and, inter and, and kind of interface between them by going from one to the other, back from one to the other, and you can loop as many times as you can. Eventually what happens, the connection gets so bad that the tones that go through aren't really going to be registered anymore. And uh, you can get about, uh, I think the biggest record was I think 30 or 40 links. Now there's another way of stacking tandems too, which is a little bit more, uh, with a little bit more finesse. I actually developed that technique by understanding how the, how the bandwidth of a phone call is. The telephone frequency response of a long distance call is from 300 to 3000 hertz. 2600 is just up at the upper edge of that, of that, uh, of that uh, bandwidth. If you happen to send uh, a 3200 hertz along with the 2600 hertz, there is one little little uh, technology that the phone company put into their network that will actually prevent you from uh, disconnecting your call if you have a very high-pitched woman on the phone talking, okay? And so to prevent that from happening, what they've done is they put a, a, a system of electronics together called a guard band. Guard band, what guard band does, guard band basically, if there's any other frequency besides 2600 present in, in the audio channel, then that 2600 will not trip the call and disconnect your call. And uh, many, many people have complained initially when they first put the system together uh, that they were getting disconnected. So by uh, exploiting this limitation in the guard band, what you can do is you can put 3200 hertz along with the 2600, but your 3200 hertz level, you need to be able to adjust its volume, but leave the 2600 volume exactly the same. So when you start your call, you keep your 3200 kind of low, and each time you loop through, you can push yourself forward each time, adding a little bit more 3200 to, to guard that band, and you can go through and you can hop from hop to hop. So at the end office, because when, when you drop the call or trip the call, you're not going to land locally anymore. You're going to land at the distant trunk, and you keep pushing yourself forward, pushing yourself forward. And I pioneered that technique. You can only get about 10 hops out of it, but you don't have, you're not just restricted to just using number one crossbars. You can do it with any network, and that's what made it very powerful. So after sending the 2600 hertz tone, you listen to the handshake, you do key pulse, area code number start, and that's how you make a call. Now, how did uh, the blue, how did the uh, Esquire magazine article came to being? There was this guy, Don Ballinger. He was like one of these, uh, mafia type persons, he built a blue box 
He was using information number to call. He would call 555-1212 numbers. If you do area code 555-1212 and call information operator, that's a free call. But when you call information operators, when she picks up the phone, you don't get that on-hook signal or off-hook signal. It just shows still that it's on-hook. So if you make the call with 555-1212, all of a sudden you see a lot of 555-1212s on your bill as completed calls, which are never supposed to happen. You get busted pretty quick, and that's how he got busted. He went and contacted one of his buddies, Ron Rosenbaum, who wrote the Esquire article. And then it was Steve Jobs that uh, basically uh, uh, talked Wozniak into making a blue box. Woz complied. He, wrote, he made a blue box. But he didn't know the frequencies, because the ESPAR article would not give you those frequencies. So all Steve did was went down to Stanford University, got the Bell System Technical Journal, and there's where the blue box tones were, right there for all to see. Again, a really stupid mistake on that part. Well, in 1964 to 1968, I joined the US Air Force. I got stationed at probably one of the most worst places in the world to be. I mean, this place was a real shithole, way up in Alaska way above north of the Arctic Circle. I, have, I got stationed up there for a year. And I occupied myself by hacking the military phone system. They have their own separate phone system, totally separate from the civilian system. But I can call bases that, that are close by, that are local call, to San Jose. One of them was Almaden Air Force Station, which is a big radar system set way on top of a mountain. And I could just call them and then ask that switchboard operator to connect me to a local San Jose number. And that's how I can make free calls. But other than also, uh, you can also do a lot of other things with the Audubon. You've got different flash and priorities. Like you've got four levels, three levels of priority. You've got priority, you've got flash, you've got flash override. That's the highest priority. And once you put a call through with flash override, man, everybody wakes up. So it's all internal of military phone system. They thought. There is no way that you can go from the civilian network to the military. Wrong. There are two points, one at Nicholson Creek, Alaska, and also Murphy Dome, Alaska, which uses the same trunk for both military and civilian use. All you had to do was you just had to come in at the right trunk level to do it. You call Key Pulse 907, that's the area code for Alaska, 940. 9501, start. It goes through, guard band it through, bingo, you're on the Audubon. You use, uh, you use, use key pulse, key pulse one, key pulse two, and those for the priority calls, and you can make priority military calls on the Audubon. Both the US Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the federal telephone system was all using that system. And that two-way bridge existed in Murphy Dome, Alaska, up until about 1981. Maybe a little earlier, I'm not sure. All right, now one other thing I wanted to also talk about a little bit is some of my uh, current, e my little views on current events. Anonymous, everybody knows about Anonymous. They, I can say one thing for sure about these guys. They really have given the authorities a wake-up call. I support them in that way. People need to get woke up about what's going on, and I think these guys are doing a good job. Not that I support a lot of their other stuff they did. Sanjay, well, I'm not so well informed on this issue. Last I heard, he was still at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. And uh, take down that URL called youtube.com, watch. That's the URL for the Anonymous. Uh, it's about an hour and a half documentary on Anonymous. I highly recommend you watch it. It may change your views on Anonymous. I'll tell you, when I watched it, it sure woke me up. I was really amazed. And as far as Manning is concerned, with my familiarity with the military, I doubt if Manning will ever see the light of day for a very long time. What he did was absolutely unforgivable as far as the military goes. That was bad, bad, bad. However, there, was, there were some issues in there where you know he brought to light certain very important issues. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about now is um, my, uh, my, my ideas of using uh, Crunch Creations. I found Crunch Creations about a year and a half ago. And I've got crunchcreations.net. That's my client-facing page. So if you're a client and want services, uh, you go to there and you get an idea of what, what we do. And there's a blog, a discussion blog at crunchcreations.com. And what we're doing is we're building a members-only web franchise where if you are a 
qualified member, and to get be a member of Crunch Creations, you really have got to know your stuff. Uh, so far, about 20 Indian programmers have applied, and all 20 have failed miserably. Because this is how uh, this is how strict we are. But if you're if you're really good and want to get involved in this kind of aspect, uh, I highly recommend it. We're building a really nice web uh, web franchise where people can collaborate with businesses and, and do contact work with uh, very large projects. Uh, you can collaborate with your client and with your project leader, and your project leader would have access to all the work that you do, and uh, will help uh, organize your work and uh, help build your projects and manage your projects. It's still in the design phase right now, but it's probably one thing that's really, really cool, and uh, I'm really proud to, proud to be part of it, and I really want to see other people try to contact us. Uh, at the end of my talk, you'll see my contact information. Contact me if you're interested. I'm sure that there'll be something in there for you if, you're really, if you really are good. Okay, you have to be really good, that's for sure. Ecoviso. This is another little pet project of mine. Uh, I've always been into uh, building sustainable communities ever since day zero. Uh, our whole economy and our whole infrastructure is falling apart as we speak. Uh, there's gas prices getting insanely expensive right now. No telling what's going to happen in five years or ten years from now. It, uh, there was a little experiment done on, uh, on a TV program called the 100 Mile Challenge. What you, what you had to do, they took about maybe six or seven families scattered throughout the United States. And they challenged them to only get food within 100 miles of where they lived. Every single one of those six families have failed miserably. They cannot get food from within 100 miles. They've either had to, to stop the program or they've had to uh, use other, you know, to not do it. Your groceries that you get in your grocery store in the U.S. ship from thousands of miles away. What happens when that shipments? What happens when that shipping infrastructure fails? How are you going to eat then? Okay, so a lot of stuff that we're doing in EcoVisa, we're building new ideas on energy generation and storage. For instance, uh, ultracapacitors, which show a lot of promise, allow you to be able to charge very, very quickly with humongous amount of power. And there's research being done by FastCapSystems.com, uh, and uh, FastCap Systems is a company that was. Uh, Granted, I think they got like a $20 million grant from the company. This MIT uh, uh, in his, uh, graduate work did some research in nanotechnology using, uh, using these ultracapacitors, and they were able to rival uh, lithium-ion batteries as far as storage density. So there's a lot of good, exciting things happening in store in the future. Uh, so what we do is we address sustainability in both financial uh, even financial sustainability is getting to be really bad right now. The whole economic system in the United States is probably going to be one big Ponzi scheme. It's going to collapse unless we do something about it. Energy, transportation, food, and water, all of these things are very important to consider in the future and building your, your sustainable community. What we're going to be doing is we're going to actually be building a virtual community online and putting together the, the people who have the knowledge to build uh, power systems, to have the mechanical knowledge to build uh, uh, anything that they want for their community, including leadership and everything else like that. And that's what we're doing. We're kind of exposing visitors to new and old technologies to make things work. Other projects I'm involved in, of course, is my book and movie projects. There's a documentary out called Hack This Movie. It's, uh, it currently works in progress. You could probably Google it, get an idea, read the, read the trailer. and. Uh, my, uh, my book I'm working on right now, I'm about maybe 12 chapters into my book. Um, I've interviewed probably close to 30 people so far. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to interview Jobs in time before he passed, but I did get a lot of really cool information, and I can't wait to tell you about that book by having you go out and get it and read it, And because uh, I've been doing a lot of research. I would say 80 to 90 percent of my effort in working on this book has been research, research, and research. I mean, there's lots of stuff I did, and I have to go back over and look for it. My best friend is Wikipedia and Facebook and LinkedIn. Those are the three sources that I use for my research because, uh, for instance, I want the dates of the Homebrew Computer Club. Aha, Wikipedia's got it. Okay, so I use a lot of this information from a lot of 
sources, and I'm putting together all this information into a very comprehensive book. The book is about me. The book is about my life, how I started, where I grew up, where, uh, when I grew up, what my, my struggles in life were from the day I was born until right now. So that's what my book is. It's not going to be a, a book on how to phone freak. That's, that book is coming out next year, and that book is by uh, Phil Lapsley, and it's a book on phone freaks. And that book is going to be all the technical gory stuff that we used to do in phone freaks. I highly recommend you get that book too when it comes out. But that's pretty much uh, what I did. And Steve Jobs, of course, and Bill Squire just recently passed. He was a very, very, uh, very uh, one of the more amazing hackers in, in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands. He developed a lot of really cool projects, one of which is called Vinyl Scratch, which is a DJ uh, system. You have these special vinyl records. It's got time code stamps on it. And you could spin and scratch this with regular records. And you could do this with MP3 files instead of going out and finding records for it. It's an amazing system. At this point, uh, I guess I can stop now for questions. I'm a little early in ending. So uh, you've got all this time that you can ask me questions. I can go back and uh, review anything that you want to ask me. And uh, so I can't really see out there too well. So. And then, of course, the last and final thing is contacting me. Uh, I'm JD Crunchman on all the social media sites. AIM, Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, Skype, LinkedIn, and MySpace. JD Crunchman on everything. So you can't possibly uh, have any you know, problems reaching me. I have a Google Voice phone uh, based in the USA. You can reach me. I can pick up these calls anywhere I'm on the internet. So do I have any questions at this point? If you guys want, since we're in this time remaining, I can go back and play some of that, uh, some of that uh, tandem stacking thing. Finish off the uh, program here. You've been listening to the beginning of the original 1975 tape, stretched to allow me to describe what's going on. Let me go back and play this part again without stopping to talk on it. <laughs> Listen to the longest stack I could find in all of the tape libraries. Oh, this yeah. is probably one of the longest stacks count the we've done <laughs> toward the end of this tape. Uh, I'm just I should let warn it play you through. that it's, there are a few of what I think are non-SF links in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm not. Do you I, know what the path was? This one he didn't record the setup. Ah. He just uh, you know stacked it up and then. Oh, I'd said, love to know where he went. Yeah, I would too. This is an amazing tandem stack, it's very long. You'll hear my flash through, and then my disconnect. Listen to the echo. Echo? Echo? Ben, how are you? I have my lines tied. Oh, this is amazing. Amazing? Okay, let's flash through. Stand by. We're now on the receiving end. Let me flash from the calling end with 26. You did this with two phones. You could switch between the two phones. Unfortunately, one of his links is not ringing forward, so that actually isn't going all the way down the line. Oh, wow, let me do it again. A little longer? Let 
Okay, let me flash this side. What you're hearing now, are, here is the disconnect. What you're hearing there are he goes to the called phone and then he flashes the calling phone just long enough not to disconnect but to just cause the flashing to go from one to the other. So what happens is on one line it goes from being really, really weak getting closer and closer and closer and closer. On the other phone line it starts really really uh, strong and getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And so you're actually seeing it from both ends. And then this is going to be part of the disconnect of one of the largest tandem stacks we did. That's wow. It. That's it. That's like very, very long stack. It took quite a bit of time to set that up. But uh, every time you hear that little chirp, what's happening is there's one telephone link that's just collapsing down after you've disconnected. And what you're looking, what you're, look, what you're listening to, you're looking, listening to the called phone. This is the phone that you called. And then when you hang up the calling phone, then you just listen to the called phone. And then the called phone is where you hear all that collapsing go down. It just kept getting closer and closer and closer and closer to your call until finally the last trunk just completely goes away. Bing! And then it's done. That's, and then that connection has collapsed and that was the whole thing. And the whole purpose of tandem stacking is to see how big of a tandem stack we can get. And, and we really found a lot of really cool things. Uh, another thing too is global tandem stacking. Global tandem stacking is where you're actually stacking uh, with a, uh, overseas lines. Like in the UK, they use 2280 hertz for their in-band signaling. And so what, but in the UK, they've got a, they don't have six-digit translation. So you have to know, in order for you to call from area to area B, you have to know what area A code is for area B. Because if you're over in area C and want to call area B, you can't use the same code. Every, every, every area you have within the UK has got a different code to do. And th until then, they went and they standardized things. They called it STD, subscriber trunk dialing. That was the first time that standard codes became in use in the UK that allowed you to call from one city to the next. And their signaling used 2280. In Australia, they used 600 hertz. So by using these different tones, you can go from country to country, and you can hop around inside this country. Then you can zap over to another country and hop inside that country, zap back into the United States and hop in there like that big tandem stack you just heard, and then go over to Australia and do something over there, and then disconnect the call. We did that, and I'm telling you, it was amazing. The quality of the audio was so bad, you just had to shout to hear, hear what you were doing. Call the next phone next to you. And, uh, um, let me dispel a few little myths here while I'm at it. Okay. Uh, John, we have a question. Yes, go there. ahead. Hi, John. Yes. A uh, question for you. Um, during your speech, you mentioned that modern systems, they use the tones. More what? Modern mm -hmm. systems, modern phone systems, right? Yeah. Yeah, especially in modern countries. Yeah. They use the tone systems. Um, I think you would be happy to know, um, in some countries, including Singapore, uh, the pool system is still on. Like, I live in Singapore, and, you know, I recently I plug old phone, which is using, you know, pools with a circle. I plug it in, I was very surprised to hear the tone, and actually it still works. So you uh, hear the 2600 chirp then, right? Probably, probably. I'm not expert. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you an idea that... Um, well, it that doesn't surprise me. I'm sure there are still com countries that use in-band. Yeah, so probably they need to support it. Um, so, it's just an idea for you, probably you can still play with the uh, old system, but at the same time, tone syst uh, the tone um, new system, right, it become more complicated, you have more stuff to play, you have complicated computers. So, I guess it's a big playground for you if, you know, you're interested to explore that would, new Yeah, system. that's very interesting. You didn't happen to have any recording of any of that, did you? What's that? You didn't happen to record any of that, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, I would have liked to have heard that tape if you did. I could probably help you analyze it. There are, there, I think, uh, as far as I know, there are places in Belize, 
which is in Central America, where you could, where they still use in-band signaling. So as I was saying earlier, let me let me dispel a myth or so. Uh, a lot of times, in the, maybe the Esper article, maybe some articles, they say that I talk on one phone, there's a 15, 20 second delay or a minute delay before I hear the voice coming out the other. That was really not a minute delay. It was just a couple seconds, probably about maybe three or four seconds delay uh, because these connections were pretty fast. But the delays, it's just the quality of the connection was just so bad. And just to see how you can just push the audio and push those old funky uh, step exchanges into something that can be just uh, amazingly uh, interesting. And the fact that we were able to do this with analog instead of digital uh, kind of like makes it for a really cool uh, thing. And I'm really glad I was able to share some of these uh, old analog uh, stuff with you guys because none of these circuits exist anymore. They're all passed in the history. The last multi-frequency uh, trunk died in 19, no, in 20, uh, 2004, yeah. Actually, that was like right about the time I was here at Hack in the Box, about a month or so before I came here in my first Hack in the Box uh, talk. And uh, I got invited by the owner of the phone company as a press thing, because they, they, were, they were retiring their, the last 2600 of a link. I respectfully declined, because in California, the possession and use of a blue box is still illegal, even though they never work. So if you have one, uh, technically you're illegal, but I doubt if you could do anything dangerous to hurt yourself with one. There is something very interesting too, and that is there's the MF project, uh, and there's an 800 number, not an 800 number, but there's a number you could call, and you could blue box on that, on that call, and you could control things with it and make calls and patch yourself through. And they're using an Asterix PBX box on it, and they've built some old, uh, old technology that could use the 2600 hertz tone to switch from one box to the other using that technology. And it's sort of like kind of a plaything where you can play around with your blue box. If you still happen to have one, you can go to the MF project. You can just Google it, MF project, I'm sure, and they'll give you, uh, they'll get, they, there's a phone number you can call, you can call up and you can dial into it and you can use your blue box. So again, like I said, it's kind of fun stuff. Uh, that's about it, guys. Thank you very much for inviting me, and, and I'll be around, so if you, any, if you have any questions, just come up to me and ask me then, you know? Thank you.